Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, good morning. Good morning, good morning, good morning. We having our own reveille here, huh? <laughs> Seems like it to me, yeah. It's nine o'clock. I just got that. Thank you very much. <laughs> as as we always do at nine a.m., um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen here real quick and put our flag up. And if I could ask everyone to rise and say the pledge of allegiance. Thank you. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States, 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 States of America. America. And, and to the republic, the republic in which it stands, one nation, one nation under God, God, under God indivisible, with liberty and justice, justice for all. Thank you. Um, I actually saved this. It's a kind of a special treat. We had a we had a prayer in the General Assembly a couple okay, of weeks ahead. ago now, and uh, uh, Delegate Jacobs did the prayer. First, I'm going to ask everybody if you could please mute. Um, and then I'm going to ask Target Jacobs if he would okay. be so kind uh, yeah. as to do his can prayer. I hold, can you hold just one minute here? I've got Maybe. something going on here on my computer that I, I need to hold. <laughs> and then, and then I'll you know, you're on your own in your hut. <laughs> you got to mute, Joanne. <laughs> Thanks, Jay. All right, Target Jacobs. <laughs> How about that? My own staff is trying to one up me on the prayer this morning. <laughs> Anyhow, thank you, uh, Delegate Aarons. And, uh, um, this morning, I'm offering a prayer, and with everyone, please bow their heads. America is hurting. Pandemics, racial divides, job loss, and political division have caused great suffering. We are all called to be salt and light on the earth. As Christians, we can begin healing our land through prayer and action. Let us come together, not just by words, but a faith that produces works. The love and grace of God can begin turning the tide of America. We look to you and to you only, Lord. Help us make wise decisions that move our country in the right direction. Help us do our part in praying and in staying with what we know is right according to the truth of your word. Teach us to make our actions count and our words matter. And line them both up to your sense of rightness, not ours. Guide us with your eye, grip us with your strong arm, teach us what we need to know to make our lives and our nation Join count for you. I'm, amen. Estate pieces, rugs. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Amen. Thank you. And then, um, Once again, can I ask some folks to mute? They do some feedback in there. Um, Aaron, Jim, Matthias, Senator, could you please mute? Oh, you are. I'm sorry. I don't know how you're on my screen live, but you're the guy up there right now. Maybe you're first up. All right. <laughs> you're good. <laughs> all right. Good morning, everyone. Um, first of all, let me let me do a little bit of housekeeping here. Uh, first of all, I need a motion to approve the minutes. So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Okay. Uh, another thing I want to do is um, I want to make sure everybody in the audience knows that typically we don't take questions from the audience. If you have something you feel is urgent, try and get in touch with one of your delegates or senators. Hopefully they can get it through to them, to us, or you can try to message me, but I'm kind of running a meeting. The other thing I, I have to do is I have to offer a sincere apology. Apparently when we set up this meeting and I was remiss in this um, for the Eastern Shore University and college presidents, we, this is, goes back a little while we used to do this group because it was lower shore and we did not update the list. I did not update the list to include uh, Washington College and Cecil. I'm making a call to them and, and I, I was reminded by this by somebody asked me in an email why we didn't have uh, Washington College on this. So I, it, it, I was, I was, up, I was taken back by it. But anyway, I'm going to try to make amends and see if I can get those people on next week. And I, I sincerely apologize for that. It was, a, it was an accident on our, on our poll part. Um, okay, that being said, I'm going to ask if Dr. Heidi Anderson, you're first up on my list. Welcome. Well, good morning. Can you hear me, delegate? Yes, we can. Morning. Well, wonderful. Good morning, everyone. It is a pleasure to be here. And let me start off. I know you. Uh, we have limited time, but let me first start off by saying thank you to all of our uh, Eastern Shore delegation. 
and for inviting us to be part of this conversation today. And I'm glad to know that you're going to invite the other colleges as well. So that's a very good gesture. I want to also take a moment to say thank you to the entire Legislative Assembly and to Governor Hogan for our, your, all of your ongoing support for our campus. The University of Maryland Eastern Shore appreciates all that you do for us and also for the funding that you give us through the University System of Maryland. And thank you for that. Senators and delegates, I do want to take a few moments just to say to you that we, our faculty, our staff, our students, all of our alumni, we appreciate the role that you have played this past year, ensuring that we have broadband build out that is so critical for us here on the Eastern Shore. Our natural gas pipeline is, is laid. We already have it going into one of the new buildings, a new building, and so we appreciate that as well as the capital funding and the operational funding that you have given us. Many of you re may recall in January of this year, you uh, participated in a legislative session on our campus. Actually, it was virtual, just like this. And at that time, I shared with you that as the land grant research university on the Eastern Shore, that we remain focused on helping to solve the problems of the people of the Eastern Shore. And as a premier HBCU STEM institution and the only land grant HBCU STEM institution in the state, our plans are to continue to expand our healthcare areas as well as considered veterinary sciences. And both of these I wanted to let you know today are under market review and development by our campus. I also just wanted to say today, as you know, Maryland counties are designated, all of the Maryland counties are designated as medically underserved counties and or health profession shortage areas. So there is a need for more healthcare providers in the state of Maryland and throughout, especially the state, but also especially our rural counties. So right now I wanted to be able to bring you good news is that, as you know, you approved for us to go through and have a physician assistant program several years ago, right as COVID broke in March of 2020, we received the initial first level of accreditation for our physician assistant program. And this fall, we will enroll the full complement of students. That'll be 30 students annually that will be enrolled in our program. The first year when they allowed us to enroll, they allowed us to bring in 10 students. Then we added to that last year. So this fall will be 55. The other thing I wanna share with you is that first class of 10 will be graduating this December of 22. So it'll be a major celebration. And then the accrediting body will visit us again in spring of 2023. And after that, we'll receive final accreditation and every year it'll be 30 annually. So finally, I just wanna say to you, the our School of Pharmacy and Health Professions building will be opening and we'll be celebrating that particular grand opening and a ribbon cutting on September 15th. So please mark your calendars. I'll be sending a save the date to all of your offices so you can be reminded of that. And we hope to see you on the Eastern Shore and at our campus in September. So with that, I will release, uh, relinquish any more of my time and say you are always invited to the campus at any other time. But thank you again for my faculty, staff, and students. Thank you. Um, I think we'll hold questions till the end. I think up next we have Dr. Coppersmith. Cliff. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It's a pleasure to be with you this morning. I apologize for a uh, Broadcasting from my uh, my family room, I had some issues with my uh, my laptop this morning. Uh, but anyways, it's good to be with you all. Uh, first of all, I have to just acknowledge and thank the support we have from our delegation on behalf of my peers. We are very grateful for the allocation this year uh, on our budgets. It's going to help uh, all the community colleges recover uh, on their own rights uh, for, from the pandemic, but also better serve our students. Uh, in terms of uh, our priorities this year, we had a longstanding compensation issues to deal with our employees. And we also have our priority is getting students back to the college and uh, back to school so they can complete their, uh, their objectives. Very happy to say that uh, our enrollment is flat this spring from last year, which is progress. Uh, we hope we're at the bottom of this trough now and recovering. We saw very uh, encouraging results with our uh, dual enrollment efforts. We have near record dual enrollment this spring across our high schools uh, here on the Eastern Shore, the schools that we serve. Uh, male students are coming back to us, and we also have very healthy enrollments in our skilled trades programs and health professions programs. Roughly about 60% uh, online still. Uh, we were trying to get more students back on campus, but many of them still prefer to be online. 
but we're hoping by fall with the recovery continuing that will be more than 50-50 uh, in terms of presence on campus. We are open, uh, we are mask optional, and we have a very low level of activity of COVID on our campus, uh, very reflective of what's going on with our region. Um, we, uh, we continue to work on expanding and improving our portfolio. Very happy to say our welding program is at capacity. Uh, we're trying to expand that uh, capability. Our Marine tro uh, Trades program, a new program that we brought on in the last year and a half is doing very well as are all of our applied technology programs. So again, we appreciate the support from our Eastern Shore delegation. I've had fairly significant interactions with almost every one of you in the past couple of months. We always appreciate your support. You're always welcome to visit. And uh, I'm very happy to say that we're raring to go and uh, very happy with the, uh, the support we're getting from our Eastern Shore delegation and the governor's office. Uh, and again, thank you very much for all you do for Chesapeake. Thank you. Up next, we have Dr. Goodwin. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Arons uh, and uh, delegates and senators. Uh, it's great to see you all again this year. And uh, I would also just like to give my thanks for your support of higher education on the Eastern Shore. Uh, I would actually like to start my comments by just acknowledging uh, our colleague, uh, President White, and his leadership on the Eastern Shore and across the university system of Maryland has been absolutely remarkable in the last few years. So we at UMSEs are really going to miss his contributions, but uh, President White, we do have your number. <laughs> so uh, we look forward to continuing collaboration. So as you're all aware, uh, Maryland is unique across the US to have uh, a university that's entirely devoted to scientific and graduate education related to the environment. And even though our students and faculty work across the world and in every ocean, on the world, our primary focus is right here on Maryland, managing our natural resources and the recovery of Chesapeake Bay. We've been doing this for nearly 100 years, and we take that responsibility of supporting our state agencies and the community of Maryland very seriously. You're going to be hearing uh, an exemplar, uh, one of our star professors, uh, uh, Professor Place, later in this presentation, so I'm not going to touch on uh, his example of bringing innovation to really difficult problems. But I thought you'd be interested just to hear of three significant initiatives we have underway at the moment. First of all, I I'm sure you've seen in the popular press the concerns about plastics in our uh, oceans, and particularly the concerns focused on what are known as microplastics. These are plastic particles less than about one eighth of an inch. And it's very worrying for many reasons. They don't break down very quickly and they can have very significant impacts on our environment. So our Horn Point scientists have just begun a new research project using um, the Chop Tank River watershed as an example. They're doing this with NOAA to develop the technologies and approaches for understanding how these microplastics get transported through the environment, what the consequences are, and what we can begin to do about it. And NOAA expects the outcome of this research to inform other coastal areas in how they can monitor and understand the consequences of microplastics. Secondly, I know many of you uh, really follow the developments around wind energy, and I just wanted to let you know that uh, UMSEs together with Maryland Department of Natural Resources, the Maryland Energy Administration and the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution are partnering in launching an ocean buoy with hydrophones that can detect and understand the migratory and residence patterns of marine mammals. We expect this will give great insights in mitigating any potential impacts in the future of offshore wind energy. And the third area I just wanted to touch on is that we've been spending a lot of time thinking about what's called, uh, in the current jargon, nature-based solutions. And that is how can we protect our low and vulnerable uh, lands in the presence of accelerated uh, coastal erosion, sea level rise, uh, and all of the consequences associated with that. 
And just as one element of this major research thrust, we've been looking at the role of oysters in shoreline protection uh, through reefs, through breakwaters, putting oyster veneers on existing breakwaters, with the idea of understanding how this not only protects our lands, perhaps uh, reduces the effects of saltwater intrusion, but also how these oysters also maintain and uh, improve the water quality uh, in the bay. So with that, I know your time is short. Uh, we're very excited to continue supporting these major issues uh, on the Eastern shore. And of course, we also welcome visits to Horn Point Lab or any other of our state facilities uh, for those that want to know more. So thank you, Chair Arendt, for your, uh, giving us the opportunity this morning. Oh, we appreciate it, thank you. Up next, we have Dr. Hoy. Ready? Good morning, thank you. And uh, I'd like to join my colleagues in thanks for members to the members of the delegation for all of your support of all of our institutions. It's uh, so, so appreciative. And also wanna thank you for your participation in uh, Student Advocacy Day. Uh, student engagement, especially during this period has been very challenging and to have the uh, support from members of the delegation working jointly with our students is uh, really very helpful. Uh, our students got a great deal out of it. And I know they'd love to come to Annapolis as we all are, are ready to uh, break out and, and start doing those sorts of things. But uh, it's, it's always beneficial and really appreciate that. Just wanna to touch on a few things. Uh, we're building a new applied technology center right now. And fortunately through the generous contribution of the Guerrero family, it is named the Patricia Allen Guerrero Technology Center. It's on schedule, which is great. Uh, we'll open uh, probably, actually it's ahead of schedule. We may open by next March of 23. Um, and things are working out really well. In that facility, we'll have new programs of study. Uh, many have already been submitted to the Higher Education Commission we currently have welding. We work, work jointly with Archon and began that with a um, Maryland Energy Administration grant. We've been working since that time through EARN grants and every single completer has had a job before they even completed the program. It's a wonderful opportunity. We're gonna be expanding welding in this particular facility as well as air conditioning, heating, refrigeration, electricity, alternative energy. We're currently working with US Wind uh, with their uh, wind farm activity that they're planning uh, off of the coast of Ocean City. They're working with Community College of Baltimore County at Sparrows Point and working with us down here at this end of the state. Uh, so it's an exciting opportunity and there's gonna be a great deal of uh, work done and we help, hope to support that uh, through this new facility and other things we're doing. Uh, as Cliff said, um, we're seeing students return to campus. We're about 60% on campus at this point. Um, and that's by student choice. We have more opportunities on campus, but the students, we're giving them the opportunity to make their decisions about how they want to access their education and post COVID or in, I guess, as we're moving through COVID, uh, students are still choosing a lot of online options. We're increasing our work with Title Health, uh, especially in, with nursing and those uh, areas and our nursing assistant uh, program is running around the clock. It's uh, continuous. As soon as one class is done, the next class begins. We're trying to help them, support them in making sure that we have enough nursing assistants and RNs, LPNs uh, in our community. I want to touch on a few things. The operating budget, this is going to be the first time uh, that we have earned full CADE funding in the 25 year history of the CADE funding formula. And it's exciting. I didn't think I was gonna live long enough to see that. I was there during the hearings in 1997 and 98 uh, when the bill was uh, drafted and uh, we've never gotten there before. It's, this is great and appreciate the governor's support of that and also your support to make sure that that happens. Governor also included money for deferred uh, maintenance for the community colleges this year and additional allocation. And each institution is getting $937,500 uh, for additional deferred maintenance, a great and important thing. And we're appreciative of that. And also in his budget is the workforce readiness money, grant dollars that we're, it's matching money for dollars that we have received from business and industry uh, to support workforce uh, readiness and technology. In our case, we're using it for equipment for the new facility uh, that will be opening next year. 
On the capital side, I mentioned the new building, there's $11 million uh, of construction and, and F&E for our capital projects and uh, appreciate your support for that as well. Big issue for everyone who's building right now is certainly construction escalation. And with our project, we broke it into two phases. GMP2, our second phase of this particular project, we took to the board yesterday, came in about $400,000 over budget. And that's because of the petroleum uh, escalation that we're seeing uh, as a result of uh, the war in Ukraine. Um, the um, asphalt, which is the biggest part of this particular project, um, is a product is a petroleum product. So we're seeing uh, co escalation costs in addition to what we've seen across the board in building escalation. So I know that's gonna be an issue for a lot of projects going forward. We hope that we'll be able to get some additional funding to help support those things. Several bills I just wanna to bring to your success, the transfer with success bill. Uh, it's SB 540 and HB 598. I was a little disappointed to see that a million dollars was stripped out of this bill in the house. Uh, this is to pay maintenance cost for a system to support students in transfer from one level institution to another within the state of Maryland. Um, and we just think this is an appropriate thing to do. Frankly, it should have been housed at MHEC, but uh, it's housed through the university system. And um, it's not a big ticket item for the state, but I'm not quite sure why that was stripped out, especially after yesterday's announcement of the additional funds that the state has at your fingertips uh, to support next year's budget. Another thing I wanna mention is the community college tuition and residency waivers. That's SB 799 and HB 1102. Uh, for many, many years, bills passed uh, granting waivers to individuals. We're very supportive of providing free tuition for those individuals, but the college was paying for it. But it really wasn't the college paying for it. It's other students who are paying for it. And they're paying for it in one of two ways, either increased tuition or decreased programming. So that bill is going to provide $10 million to support the students' free tuition that, uh, that you have uh, offered them uh, through legislation. And uh, we'd appreciate uh, support of that. And finally, uh, uh, f the bill I wanna mention is SB 795 and HB 1101. It's a community college funding bill. Originally in 1998, when the community college funding, the Cade formula was initiated, the, the link in funding to the university system was at 30%. Uh, it dropped in 2008 to uh, 29%. Uh, this would bring it back to the original threshold of 30% of the per student funding at the university system uh, institution. So we'd like to see that happen and would love to have your support for that. And again, thank you for your time. Thank you for your attention and for the support of our institutions. Thank you, Dr. Hoy. Um, up next, we have Dr. Wright. White, I'm sorry. Thank you, Chair Ernst. Uh, members of the Eastern Shore delegation, I announced my retirement from the presidency at, Sal at Salisbury University last fall. So this will be my last time presenting before you in this format. And I wanna take this opportunity to say thank you. Over the last four decades, I've served in various educational roles across the country, and I can say without reservation that your ongoing and continued support of students' pursuit for higher education makes Maryland stand out. It's a major reason that Maryland continues to be a state with high educational attain attainment, high income potential, and one of the best places to live and raise a family. So again, on behalf of everyone at SU, and now from a grateful Marylander and soon to be retiree, thank you. I know that you all are familiar with the challenges faced by higher education as a result of the pandemic. And unfortunately, Salisbury University was no exception. One of the national trends that we're seeing as we slowly return to normal is that students are deciding to stay closer to home when they make their college uh, decision. We're taking actions to address our declines in enrollment and the changing landscape of higher education. In the fall, we launched a new branding campaign, Make Tomorrow Yours, to help us better tell the story of the opportunities offered to SU's graduates. During our rebranding process, we received input from students, faculty, staff, alumni, members of the, of the community, resulting in a genuine story about the SU experience. 
We also launched a stay on the shore campaign with UMES, Warwick and Chesapeake College to encourage Eastern Shore grads to stay here to continue their education at the community colleges or the universities. Sometimes it's easy to look past what graduating students look at as their local university or college, but all five of us have so much to offer and we're being more intentional about making sure that they know that. Early signs are that the efforts are paying off as our applications and deposits are already trending up and consistent with 2019, which was one of our largest years ever. We're engaging in new outreach initiatives to bring back some of our near completers, and we've committed record funding to student financial aid. The pandemic also exposed some significant areas of concern for our region and for the state of Maryland. We expanded hours and resources at our Dave and Patsy Rommel Center for Entrepreneurship, which is located in downtown Salisbury and serves members of the community as well as our own students. We want to help businesses get back on their feet and continue to pre-pandemic momentum when it comes to innovation and creativity in the state. We recently established the Center for Healthy Communities in our College of Health and Human Services with the goal of providing resources and support to historically under-resourced communities. And in addition, we're, we're committed to increasing output to in critical healthcare professions, such as nursing, where our students have the highest NCLEX pass rate among baccalaureate programs in the entire state of Maryland. Over the past two years, we've had to set up an on-campus public health operation to serve both students and our employees. We continue to test, contact trace, and provide vaccinations and other services on our campus. That's because we decided that if we're going to be open, we are committed to doing so safely and in a way that does not present a burden to our regional healthcare system. I'm proud of our ability to keep students safe and for our attention to the growing challenges related to the mental health and wellness of our students. We also recognize that although we are dealing with the pandemic, it has affected everyone differently, particularly those who come from lower socioeconomic backgrounds. At SU, we made sure that our commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion was reflected in our COVID policies and in our actions and policies overall. As president, it's been my goal to foster an environment where everyone can feel a sense of belonging on our campus. And in the midst of all of this uncertainty, our SU student athletes managed to win not one, but two national championships, one in women's lacrosse and one in baseball. I wanna thank my colleague presidents for their consistent collegiality, partnership, advice, and friendship. We got through this together. Members of the Eastern Shore delegation, you all continuously show your support for Salisbury University on campus and through your advocacy in Annapolis. We are truly grateful for that and for your ability to keep us looped in with what's going on, even when we can't be there ourselves. Again, thank you, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank, thank each and every one of you. Um, any questions? Oh, I see Del uh, Senator Carosa. Good morning, and what a great morning it is to have our uh, leaders of our higher education from the Eastern Shore. We do miss seeing you in person. I wanted to um, give um, the three presidents in my district, Dr. Hoy, Dr. Anderson, and Dr. White, just 30 seconds each on a consistent theme I heard in each presentation. And that was the acute workforce shortage, the programs that you have set up, particularly I'm hearing in healthcare with UMES, um, with uh, the, the new applied technology at, at Warwick and the entrepreneurship at um, Salisbury University. And my question is, how can we better um, have what I would almost call a feeder um, situation with our students, reaching them in high school, making sure they know of the programs you have to keep them on the shore. So um, wanted to see how we can just strengthen those partnerships um, even earlier in the process. I'd like to jump in and take that. Senator Carroza, first of all, good morning and thank you for the question. And I agree with you, making sure that we have a, a sustained workforce really starts earlier than what, when the students come to us. One of the things that we're doing, and I'm sure my partner presidents are doing as well, is we have actually partnered with our local high school right here in Somerset County, 
And we were making sure we have a, a mentor and a peer mentor and our faculty mentor bringing students in, not just from the high school, but from middle school. We have healthcare clubs that we have in the county, but we're now expanding those to the rest of the Eastern shore. And having that kind of activity where the students come to our campus in summer camps, but also keep them connected throughout the year. And then we're pleased to say, even on the other side of the shore, and I know that this group is real focused just on the Eastern, we're doing the same kind of partnering. And as the students come through and hopefully through President Hoy's Warwick, they come through and they're getting a seamless uh, four-year, almost completely paid scholarship program from us if they come through this particular path and also through Warwick. So that's what we're doing at UMES and want to expand that. Yeah. If I may. Sure. Uh, if I may, um, uh, at Salisbury, most of our uh, health professions programs are very competitive. And the bottleneck really to getting students into the workforce on the Eastern Shore uh, is all about expanding our programs and getting clinical placements for their uh, education. So we've been working with Tidal Health and our other healthcare um, uh, partners to expand the number of clinical placements that are possible, which allows us to expand our class sizes. Uh, we have a, a new grant from MHEC uh, to do that, and we are now expanding our nursing programs. And uh, we are also working with Tidal Health uh, to help us to scholarship students, especially uh, students who bring uh, enhanced diversity to our programs uh, to help students along and keep them on the Eastern Shore when they graduate from our programs. Thank you. Uh, up next, we have uh, Senator Ecker. Thank you very much, everybody. And I appreciate our team. And I'm going to piggyback with what Senator Crosswood said. Thank you so much. Any, uh, any hiccups or barriers that you all see as we get folks into the healthcare workforce, uh, let me know. I'll be working with the um, uh, administrators of our facilities with the Board of Nursing to be able to continue to get make that credentialing go smoothly. So stay tuned with that. Dr. Hoy, I had a question for you since we heard all the budget bills and the funding bills yesterday in committee, there was one that you said that the money had been stripped out. Can you give me that number again so that I can see if there's any way of um, redeeming that? Certainly. Thank you for that. In, in the Senate side, that's SB 540. Okay. And it was a House Bill 598 that uh, it's the, it was co-filed and that's where it was taken out in the House. I understand that uh, uh, Chair McIntosh has agreed to put it back in, but the uh, uh, speaker uh, said she wasn't ready for that at the moment. So not sure what happened. It was a okay. lot, of, lot of conversation yesterday about it, but we'd certainly like to see it on the uh, Senate side, get back, uh, get back. We're having, yeah, we're having those budget decisions now. So I wanna see if we can redeem that. So I'll work on that today, but I do wanna say that we're gonna be hopefully putting additional funds into health workforce because our healthcare providers have really taken the brunt in our uh, facilities through the pandemic. And we want to make sure that we're ready for whatever the next experience is going to be. So thank you all for working so closely together and making sure we have a robust workforce. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, um, our final question, uh, Delegate Sample Use. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and good morning, everyone. I'd just like to say thank you so much to all of the presidents who have uh, stayed on top of all of the things this past uh, uh, couple of years and the fact that you're still able to expand and increase um, student participation at various levels and also keeping a keen eye on the retention of it as well. Um, but I did want to just um, ask Dr. Hoy a little bit more because I haven't looked at that bill, House Bill 598, but I will look at it today sometime to just get a better understanding. But is that just specifically to you, to your institution, or is across the board in the million dollars that you reference is the one is what is affecting you? It's it's for all two and four year institutions in the state. Uh, this pays for the the colleges jointly bought a new system to support transfer. 
And this pays for the annual uh, maintenance cost uh, for those systems. And it's uh, funds that both the two and four year institutions are paying to support it. And we really think that uh, this is something that should be a statewide initiative that uh, and be paid for. And that was it was in that bill. And I don't know why it was pulled out. I was surprised by it, but uh, hope that we can get that back in. And it's just a million dollars, but it supports all of higher education. And, and again, it's really to support the students because it's to outline where their transfer, um, how a class is gonna transfer from one institution to every other institution. So if they take something with me or something with Cliff and then they're gonna transfer to Salisbury or UMES or Towson or Coppin or Bowie, um, it tells them how that course is gonna be treated in transfer. So it's not something that's really supporting the two-year institutions or the four-year institutions supporting the students in Maryland. Mr. Chair, if I might on that issue, since it's yes. urgent and time sensitive, okay. just um, to respond to the speaker um, uh, pro tem, uh, when we discussed this issue in committee, uh, we also tied it to a workforce issue because we the, the reason we need to fix these transfer issues is so we can get these um, students moving through the system. So we can directly tie this $1 million for this um, infrastructure to Im improve the transfer system um, and tie it to getting our students into the workforce faster. If I can make one more point, and I know we're short on time. This not only, when, when classes don't transfer appropriately, it not only costs the student and their parent money, but it costs the state money because you're paying for it twice. You paid for it at the two-year institution and you pay for it again at the four-year institution. So this, this supports everybody. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so Deli, much for the answer. Deli, okay. Are you done, Delegate? Thank yes, you. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Okay, I'm sorry. Thank you very much. I want to make sure your questions were answered. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your, your participation. It's, uh, it's always a great, great event to have you all here to speak about this. It not only helps us, but also helps the audience out there. And thank you very much. And we will talk to you uh, hopefully next year. All right. All right, moving forward, um, you know, in the interest of the environment, uh, we have a group coming in today, um, Aragonite. I don't know what it is at this point, but hopefully I'll find out. Uh, Mr. Evans. Actually, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, my name's Terry Blair. Uh, I'm not sure Charlie has made it onto the scene, so I'll, I'll take the- If you wanna take the lead, please. Thank I'll you. I'll take the lead at this point. Good morning. Uh, my name is Terry Blair, and I'm one of the founders of a company called Blue Ocean Biosystems. Uh, thank you initially for the opportunity to address you and present the findings of our company, which we believe offer a unique Terry, opportunity. Excuse me one second. Do you have video available to you? I, I do not at the moment. I'm okay. sorry. <laughs> which we believe offers a unique opportunity to address some of the environmental problems that have plagued the state and the Bay and particularly the Eastern shore over many years. Um, I'd like to introduce some of my, uh, my partners who are present with us on the call today, as well as our guest presenter. Uh, on the call is Greg Kelly. Greg is one of our founders whose experience includes over 20 years in the health science division of KPMG. Uh, Greg is our CFO and science officer. Uh, Charlie is one of our founders also. Uh, I don't know at the moment uh, uh, why he's not on the call. Uh, we had anticipated that he would be. Some of you may know him from his experience at the DNR and also his involvement in multiple environmental initiatives in the state. And finally, we have Dr. Alan Place from UNSEES. And Dr. Place has served as our principal investigator in multiple grants, which we've received from the Maryland Industrial Partnership. Very briefly, um, I, I will speak about the origin of our company and then turn the uh, microphone over to, their, to our science team for uh, a pres short presentation and to answer any questions. We are a Maryland company. We were formed in late 2014 to study the capabilities of a natural and self-replenishing material gathered from the waters off of the Bahamas, known as olitic aragonite, and particularly uh, with respect to its potential use in environmental matters. Our first step was to acquire a supply link with the holder of a long-term lease from the Bahamian government to obtain and export aragonite to the United States. 
Then over the next few years, we've sponsored multiple research projects to determine the capabilities of aragonite to assist in several areas, including the remediation of excess nutrients, particularly phosphorus and nitrogen, running from agricultural fields and farms into our waterways. Its ability to assist in the reduction of ammonia emissions from animal litter, particularly chicken houses, and its ability to improve the quality of our agricultural fields. In this process, we have discovered mechanisms of action which enhance the performance of the raw material and for which we have filed patent protections. We have engaged nationally and internationally recognized experts to conduct our studies. The Professor Emeritus of Soil Study for the University of Georgia to perform uh, our soil studies. Dr. Hung Lee of the University of Delaware to perform our poultry litter and ammonia emission testing. And Dr. Place, who's with us today, who's been our general scientific guide in this process and whose primary expertise relates to water science. Throughout the process, we've kept our focus on issues of efficacy, safety, and economic feasibility of our solutions. With respect to soil studies, we conducted head-to-head -head studies comparing the use of aragonite as a soil amendment to FGS gypsum, which has been for years recognized as a best management practice by the Federal Department of Agriculture. And our findings have been that aragonite outperforms gypsum without any of the potentially harmful components of gypsum. Our poultry limit litter studies have shown the ability to use our product to produce significant reduction of ammonia emissions while producing a usable end product, which allows the litter to be applied to soils while reducing leaching of phosphorus and nitrogen and retaining those nutrients in the soil for plant availability. Our water studies have demonstrated the capability of our product to significantly reduce levels of phosphorus and nitrogen from water samples laden with excess nutrients and thus open the door to potential use in wastewater treatment. We're now at the point in our research where results have indicated to us that we should alert our legislators to what we have found, and that is our purpose today. It would be our hope that if the legislature finds our solutions to be promising, that it would join us as a strategic partner of sorts in spreading the message that we have to deliver. That is that we can improve our waters, soils, and airs with the use of a naturally occurring substance without harm to the environment or to the farmers and with the added benefit of enriching our soils for the future. So with that introduction, I'd like to turn the presentation over to Greg Kelly and who will then turn it over to Dr. Place. Thank you. Thanks, Terry. Uh, good morning, everybody. As Terry mentioned, my name is Greg Kelly. I'm one of the founders of, the, of uh, Blue Ocean uh, as well. Um, and I, uh, uh, I'm really here to, to, to help you understand a little bit more about what aragonite actually is, what we think it can do. And I'm going to do a, a, a I'm going to let you guys in on some of the support that we've been receiving from the state of Maryland. I know you're interested in how the state can support small business and what it does. And I'm going to give you some uh, some ground on that. Um, aragonite is essentially a, a, a different form of calcium carbonate. So the limestone that you hear about is a, is a sister. It's They're both CA, uh, C, CA, CO3, uh, but aragonite has a different crystalline structure and the, the structure is quite different. So it leads to a whole series of either uh, better functionalities or different functionalities than you would receive from mere lime. Um, some of, the, some of the, the characteristics or attributes of, of aragonite or, is that it can absorb and adsorb. Adsorb means get stuck on the surface. A variety of, of materials that you may be interested in having stuck or bound, but it does so in a, in a, in a reversible way. Some of those substances include things like phosphorus that are in soils or in waters, um, heavy metals. There's all sorts of things that can adsorb. So it gets stuck to the surface. And then if we want to, we can get it off of that surface very, rather easily. Um, it provides bioavailable forms of, of a variety of substances like calcium and like uh, carbon and oxygen. And also it, it comes because it's, it's sourced from the, the waters of the Bahamians, uh, of the Bahamas. 
it, it comes with a variety of supporting trace elements that are that are useful in a variety of circumstances. It's a great buffer with respect to pH, and it can help to uh, manage and control moisture content of a variety of environments. It can help to improve the, the, the health and structure of soils, especially soils that have been more or less deadened by the continued and uh, long-term use of artificial fertilizers. It's, it, it plays into the idea of, uh, of, of getting back the, 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 uh, the, the, soil, the, the soil food web. That's what we're looking at here. Um, and maybe most interestingly to me, it, it can attract, house, and support the growth and proliferation of a variety of beneficial microbes. So the overall message here is that aragonite is clearly not our grandparents' lime. This is really, uh, it's, it's calcium carbonate on steroids. Let's look at it that way. Um, I, I do want to mention the support we've received from a variety of institutions, et cetera. I, I, we've, we've made the rounds with uh, a bunch of the secretaries, and we've gotten great support, advice, wisdom, guidance from uh, places such as Maryland Department of, uh, of the Environment. We've gotten uh, support, including financial support, from the, the Maryland Department of Agriculture. We really received tremendous guidance and support from the Department of Natural Resources. And both as an independent entity and as a, a provider of uh, focused funding through the MIPS program. I do want to shout out about MIPS. MIPS has been our, our greatest supporter financially from an outside perspective. And we've won a, a series of awards through MIPS and it's an outstanding program from a grassroots com uh, company such as ours. We, we can't say enough about MIPS. Um, and then when we get to the to the to the systems, the the, the research people, we've we've been able to attract a number of outsiders that are that are great. Uh, some of the funding that we've received through MIPS has allowed us to to fund people that aren't necessarily in Maryland when we need ex expertise that's outside of what we can provide here in the state. But I really want to give a great shout out to uh, to UMSIs in particular, and most particularly to uh, to Dr. Al Place who. Uh, we, we, we were introduced to and, and we, we funded through a variety of, of MIPS support, but he has done more for our company than can reasonably be expected by any researcher. Just a great, great guy. UMSIS is a fantastic program. It aligns up very well with, uh, with what we are doing. Um, finally, I do want to say this. We, we do have a number of different products that we are developing. And we have what I will consider to be sort of a test market or proof of concept distribution of the product, both in its, in its raw form, particularly. We haven't enhanced or fortified. And when I say enhance, what we do is we have a process for increasing the surface area and or porosity of the material, which makes its benefits even stronger. And we also are looking at a variety of ways to inoculate it with a variety of substances either inoculate or, or just have it absorb substances for delivery that would encourage, again, mostly the growth and proliferation of, of microbes, which is what you want, beneficial microbes. Um, to that end, we have uh, gotten this stuff spread on approximately 25,000 acres, raw material, thrown it on the farmlands. And so far the feedback has been really just fantastic from the farmers. There is a, I'll call it a groundswell, frankly. People are, are uh, excited. They're dancing in the streets, frankly. And we, we expect that you'll hear more and more about this product as we move forward. Um, and with that, I think I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Dr. Al Place. Thank you. Delegates, can I try to share a three minute video? Yes, you can. Okay. Everybody can see that? We see you, yeah. <laughs> I'm a professor at the Institute of Marine Environmental Technology. It's my pleasure to describe the work we've been doing for the last five years with Blue Ocean Biosystems. I want to talk about an amazing material, what I'm calling Mother Nature's phosphate sponge. And it's a naturally forming calcium carbonate, uh, but it has amazing properties, more so than just being a liming agent. 
This is a naturally harvestable material uh, from the Bahamas, basically. And it has many properties uh, that make it very, very unique, including phosphate binding, uh, nitrogen removal, a pH elevation. Um, and it has a really nice shape. And Blue Ocean has a partnership with a calcium who is currently harvesting this material, bringing it up um, to the US. We found many agricultural benefits for it. It's, uh, in fact, we've been able to increase the surface area from this 1.7 square meters to 4.1 uh, with a, a specific uh, treatment uh, that Blue Ocean uh, is patenting. It has the ability to raise the pH in soil, very important on the eastern shore. And more importantly, our, our aspect, it absorbs phosphorus. And it's also a very efficient source of calcium. So in this material uh, that you see in the middle, uh, we've had many projects that we've looked at. Starting with um, a project that we looked at, the, the role it could play in recirculating aquaculture, both raising the alkalinity of the system as well as buying phosphate. And that was with Maryland Industrial Partnership funding uh, with Blue Oceans. We then had a second uh, MIPS that dealt with uh, recovering soil, uh, recovering phosphate from soil and stream leaching off of agricultural. And then we were also able to show that we could put this in bioreactors um, that could be used for removing nitrogen as well as phosphorus and not uh, producing methylmercury, uh, which is a current problem with it. Now, more recently with MDA funding, we've been actually applying it to phosphate soils, uh, showing that it actually in principle, looks like it does the same thing that gypsum does. It actually holds on to phosphate off the leaching. An interesting subsite uh, that was brought in is that it turns out that if you add aragonite to chicken litter, it looks like it lowers ammonia emissions from the, uh, the house itself and can then still be applied to soil. And then lastly, with funding from uh, the Bailey Wildlife Foundation, we've been a a actually able to mimic this process um, in the lab, producing it, so not having to harvest it at all. So I hope I'm, it's too bad that I'm not uh, in present. I'm current. So I'm going to stop sharing. Um, and, and the word that was ending, that was actually because I was in Hawaii. Uh, so the, the, the take home that we want the delegates to know and everything else and, and let the farmers know, there is a material out there that can do all the processes uh, that they would normally do with none of the negative effects. Um, and this, we just met yesterday with Purdue. Um, if, if this production, we're seeing in some houses an 80% reduction in ammonia emission, 80%. Um, and if that is actually found through all, all the industries, um, it'll be a big impact. And also we're seeing really positive effect with the farmers in terms of what they have to do on the Eastern shore. Um, and for the stuff that we do in terms of aquaculture. Um, in, in full disclosure, I have no equity in this company. <laughs> um, so uh, this is purely being done um, on my part to deal with environmental issues. And God, if this single material can do phosphate mitigation along with ammonia emissions and along with nitrogen uh, uh, reduction and this idea of bioreactors, which is what Iowa is, is, is using big time to reduce nitrate in the soil um, without, in our case, without the production of ethylmercury. So I'm open for questions at this point. Um, but the main thing is this is an informational thing to the centers. Uh, all this work is on the Eastern shore <laughs> and I'm over here on the Western shore in Baltimore. <laughs> okay, I think uh, first off we have Delegate uh, Jacobs. Here we go. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I guess I'll direct some of my questions to uh, Mr. Place. Uh, I, I mean, I've watched this uh, introduction in the state since 2014. I think it's really a, pro a product that's shown an enormous promise. And uh, I'm glad to see the presentation. I wish you would give this presentation to uh, my committee, Environment and Transportation, and let them get a good look at at uh, some possibilities that may curb some of our 
uh, issues that come before our committee. Um, in looking at this, uh, uh, I know you you say you've spread it over, I think, 25,000 acres. And is, um, is some of that acreage down in the southern um, eastern shore where we have legacy phosphorus? Yes. And, and I can answer that. Yeah. It, it is. It is actually. Yeah, you're familiar with the legacy uh, legacy group. I think it's called down there. The the, the big uh, uh, farming community that that yeah. is, is more or less a co-op. <laughs> uh, they're the ones that that were most enthused about this. And I'll I'll tell you what happens with a new product, especially one like this, is that sometimes you're out a little bit too early. And I will tell you, in 2014, in speaking with farmers, the big word in their minds was chemistry. As we've, as we've uh, evolved, I'll say, into the early 2020s, the big word is starting to be biology. And what these guys are really enthused about is the potential for this stuff. The way it appears to be working out, this is conjectural, but conjectural with a basis in science. It appears that in year one, we can improve yields and reduce a little bit of the inputs that are necessary to get those yields, meaning you don't have to use as much uh, artificial fertilizer, et cetera. In a longer time frame, if this stuff is used appropriately, you'll actually be able to improve the health of the soil and the structure of the soil itself. So you're moving from a situation where the soil is effectively dead because you've killed it by the use of artificial fertilizer over a long period of time to where you start attracting components of the, of the, of the, the soil uh, food web back. Primarily, you know, mo most of the heavy lifting in, in, in agriculture is done by bacteria. And I say that because the way it really works is that plants attract the bacteria they need by sending out signature exudates and attracting what they need. So if they need a bacteria to convert something from here to there, they need something to transport from here to there. They do it by sending out chemical sig signals that are, that are attached to, to sugars, et cetera. And those bacteria come and feed off of that. And that's where they get the benefit from. That's where the transformation comes. That's where the, the, the materials come from. If there's not a lot of bacteria surrounding these plants, they can't orchestrate that. So they're less vigorous, they're subject, prone to more disease, et cetera. So that's really the big picture in agriculture for us is this would be a, a key supporting player for getting the soils back to health. And the good news is that the farmers have, have, have really started to embrace this whole premise. So that's what we're seeing. So luckily the, the, the mindset is starting to move in our direction. I appreciate that answer. Um, you know, I've got more questions, but there, I see other my colleagues have got their hands raised. The one question that I want to, and I'm not being critical at all, but one of the concerns when you bring a product in from another location, uh, is there is there any? I mean, I know you do testing, but is there any possibility that there would be any disease that could come with this product? Um, you know, sort of like MSX and Dermo that was introduced back in the 80s from, from an out-of-state source. Um, I haven't heard of anything, and, and I'm not being at all critical. I just want to be kind of put that to sleep if, uh, you know, if it's so that it's not there. So uh, a couple questions I'll, I'll let you know. So first of all, uh, this material is not going to make the phosphate go away. OK, those soils that are high in phosphate, it's going to take a while for the plants and everything else. The key thing it does in soil, two things, it retains phosphorus during those heavy rain events. So you're not going to see that flush of nutrients out into the, the Chesapeake Bay. And that's what we're trying to get hard data on. And that's a, that's a very difficult set of experiments, but we're doing that uh, with our uh, uh, Eastern Shore uh, Horn Point people, basically. The other thing is we've analyzed the bacteria um, of what comes with the system, basically. Um, and it's standard bacteria. Um, th th this is not stuff that's been exposed to prior animal exposure and everything else. This is 
a, a round sand material basically you got about a you know 100 meters down in the bahamas basically that's made every year and it's renewable that's the key thing guys and this is a carbonate so that it's a co2 removal system um the ocean takes up co2 and ultimately precipitates it and then with ultimately um the, the key thing with the chicken litter the mechanism of ammonia emission is completely different from all other amendments that are currently used. And it's because we've changed the bacterial community because aragonite does this amazing thing called changes the water activity. It actually retains water in a, uh, a more bound state basically, and it actually lowers the moisture content of the chicken litter. So these are the, and these were not anticipated different uh, th things when, uh, Blue Ocean showed me the data that it's they put into. Sorry, the, the Blue Ocean showed me the data that they did in the chicken houses. I didn't understand what the hell was going on because it's not absorption of ammonia. What it did is it actually changed the bacterial community so they no longer broke down uric acid coming from the pea and what waste material. I hope that answers the questions. Well, and I, I can just one one set, second here. Um, there, we, we've seen we've done extensive testing on its safety. And we've never seen evidence of any type of, uh, of, of corruption. Right. Thank you very, thank you very much for your answers. Sure. All right. Up next, we have Delegate Hornberger. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I'm still not understanding what your product does. Is it a phosphorus binder that prevents the phosphorus from leaving the soil? Well, it doesn't, pre it doesn't prevent. So um, it is a standard a liming agent that farmers would use to raise soil pH. So it raises soil pH on the Eastern shore from 5.2 to about 6.5, the, the optimal pH. That's its function as a liming agent. Secondly, it has this unique property. It binds relative to calcite and other ag lime. It binds seven times more phosphate on a molar basis, but that binding is not irreversible. It's still available for plants. So what it's doing, it's, it's lowering the leaching event okay. during rain events, which is when almost all of the, when we have this nutrient input, uh, you know, on the Eastern shore from the trips and so forth. And the other thing it does is to change the microbial community because it is an alkaline and this water absorption capability, this water activity. Um, water activity is amazingly important uh, for whether pathogens can grow or not. And are you looking to increase uh, PSMs? Uh, describe what for you PSM means. So I would run the solubilizing microbes. What? So, uh, so it, it, in essence, it, it could. We haven't done the soil part. All we've been doing is looking at the leaching events during rain events off agricultural um, farms on the eastern shore. So we have piezometers where we're actually measuring uh, water output and so forth. So in the in the case where there is, you said you apply this to areas where there's the phosphate levels of the soil are too high. Or, or normal. Or normal, aside from the pH. I mean, because we can accomplish that with just lime application. But um, so if we're looking at the areas where it's too high, if this is a binder and it does or does not increase the metabolism or, or the, the changing of the phosphorus, wouldn't, wouldn't that actually impede the lowering of the phosphorus in those so, high so, so, the so the, Yeah, so what it's gonna do, it, it is the phosphorus that is above, you know, 500 FIV values, everything else. Uh -huh. We're not gonna, all we're gonna make sure is that it's not gonna be leaching off those soils right. during rain events, but it does, mm -hmm. make, it does make the phosphorus more available uh, to the plants. Okay. You get me? Yeah, I just, I mean, I would think that you would want to metabolize it in the areas that it's too high more quickly, but you're saying but, that but, this but, neighbors that. Yeah, but the problem yeah. is phosphorus, unlike nitrogen, uh, phosphorus is not volatile. In other words, it, it you, you can't turn it into nitrogen gas like you can with nitrogen, okay? Right. And so the problem, all it's going to do, what we're trying to do is it's still going to raise the soil pH, and the other thing I should say, too, uh, for you guys and the chicken litter, what we've done is we've improved the, the phosphorus and nitrogen ratio. And the aragonite in the chicken litter can then be put on the fields as a fertilizer and still do soil pH increases and 
re retain phosphorus from leaching. And, and I, I can follow up briefly. We, we, we have been looking, look, look part of this, this whole deal is the idea of inoculating. When you start talking about inoculating, there's a couple of things you don't want to do. You don't want to necessarily be bringing in exogenous bacteria into a place that it shouldn't be in. The second thing is you don't want to get involved with things like genetically modified organisms, et cetera. So we try to avoid all that stuff. But certainly phosphorus solubilizing bacteria are kind of a front and center proposition when we get to the point where we're actually inoculating the sand and provide, I'm sorry, inoculating the soils and bringing it into a, onto a farm. That would probably be one of my early uh, targets in terms of what I would want to inoculate it with. I will tell you this though, that right now what's happening is we're getting shifts in the, in the soil biome. And what we're trying to do is assess the degree to which those shifts are beneficial. They appear to be very beneficial. It could very well be that we're creating our own soup for inoculant by virtue of, of creating these shifts. And all we're really talking about from an inoculation perspective is, pre, is providing a bolus effect. So we, we introduce a higher level or higher concentration of beneficial bacteria to give the soil a jump start. At the end of the day, the soil has to do the heavy lifting. We're just being a catalyst for it. I, I think we're getting way sure. deep into this. I appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we're, run, we're, we're running over schedule, so um, I don't see any other questions. And I, I do want to thank you. If anybody has any questions for these guys, um, please get in touch with them. I think we can share your information with the, with the group. Yes. But, uh, thank you very much. Thank we're you, Walter. Okay. Certainly thank appreciate you. it. Right. Hey. Uh, no problem. Up next, uh, Delegate Hornberger, you wanted to speak on a piece of legislation. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, apologies for last week, we ran over and had to jump off. Uh, so, so real quickly, um, for consideration of the delegation, uh, we have HB 1337. Uh, this bill specifically applies to the Eastern Shore and deals with, uh, with the census cycles, as well as um, how we're um, electing in districts 36 and 37. So um, back when this bill was conceived in the, in the 90s is, is when it was uh, passed, the districts on the Eastern shore were smaller. And what's happened over the years as we've lost or stayed the same in our population and the rest of the state has grown, our districts continue to get larger and cover more space and, and they ensnare additional counties. So currently, if you are in district 36, when you run, you have the name of your county at the end of your name on the ballot. And, um, you know, while that is, you know, it gives you some identity, it prevents someone from uh, specifically Caroline County, uh, it, it puts steeper election odds against them because the, the portion of Cecil County and Queen Anne's in its entirety are much larger uh, than they are for Kent in the Caroline portion. So it ends up with a de facto you know, in an even playing field, assuming all things are equal, it ends up with a de facto of electing one from Cecil, one from Kent, and one from Queen Anne's. Um, and it goes even so far as if, if two people were to be the highest vote getter from Cecil, uh, then, or, or Caroline, or I'm sorry, uh, yeah, it's Caroline, which are the two highest population centers, that second highest vote getter would not be elected. Uh, and then the district 37, um, it's, there's multiple counties as well. And in this uh, election cycle coming up, for example, we have, we're gonna have two people that are running in Talbot. Even if the second highest vote getter in Talbot uh, goes, goes through the primary and there's another person running from a different county, they can have many less votes and still get elected because you can't have two people from Talbot. So what, uh, what this bill seeks to do is to strike that language. It would remove your, your home county at the end of your name on the ballot. It would take that off the ballot and everyone would just run like they normally do without that on the end of it. And then it would also repeal the requirement that your votes can only count for one per county. So I can go in the, in the ballot box today and say, hey, I'm from Cecil and I just wanna vote for these three Cecil people, one, two, three, select all Cecil, well, only one of those votes is gonna count. Um, so so the, the status quo that we have diminishes uh, the electorate 
And it also prevents the second highest vote getter from, from coming to the House of Delegates if, they, uh, if they're not from a different county. And because this, this uh, law only applies to the Eastern Shore, I'm ask, uh, asking for uh, potential of this becoming an Eastern Shore delegation bill because it impacts us as incumbents and who we're running against. And the bill is an emergency bill. Um, so once it's moved, it would go into effect immediately for this next census cycle. So I'd love to take any questions. Any discussion? Senator Hershey. Thanks. Senator, you um, Kevin, let me see if I understand it. So for instance, in, in, C, in District 36, this would make it a true three member delegate district is what you're saying, right? That's correct. And just to so, put in perspective, um, I can run the numbers down real quick. No, I don't need that real quick. Okay. But, but just to, I just wanna make sure I understand the concept. So in a, in a district that represents four different counties, mm -hmm. Um, it is conceivable that one county could, uh, all three delegates could come from one county, right? With the passage of this bill, that could occur. Okay. And if we did that, that would mean in the, probably in the case of District 36, two counties would go unrepresented in the General Assembly? Um, th that's surmising that the two, that the three highest vote getters would be from those two counties. But the voter right. would have no idea knowing. See, right now it's 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 virtually a guarantee that Cecil and Caroline would get a seat because they have their county at the end of their name and they have three times the population as the other. Right, but under your bill, under your suggestion, um, let's say let's say that the voters do fully understand where the candidates that they're voting on live and decide to vote from that way to begin with and decide to vote for the candidates that they see in their, in their county more often, the fact remains you could have all three delegates come from one of the four counties, right? That, that's, that's possible, but three, you would have to have three people running from one county and they would have to be the, the highest vote getter. Right, and that's, you're, you're that's possible that a, because now, that now, problem, so. now the way this is set up, um, but that would never happen. Well, yeah, so I mean, your 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 purely hypothetical position is is conceivable, but not likely. <laughs> I guess is what um, is what I would argue. Whereas the, the status quo guarantees that we get a candidate from Cecil and Caroline. Uh, because they are at 53,000 and 49,000, whereas Kent and Caroline are at 12,000 and 19,000. I'm not sure how, I, how, how my suggestion is hypothetical and yours is a guarantee. Because at, because at the end of currently on the ballot now, it lists the county that you're from. Right. And, and right now we have representation from all four counties in District 36 not residency representation. We have residency. You can't have four counties. Four counties would be four people. Right. So we have, we have you, and, you and Cecil from District 35, mm -hmm. and in District 36, we have representation from each of those counties. I can't, you're right. I can't, I can't have four, you know, four delegates for, for a, uh, in, in the district. So the only way it can work is the way that it is now to make sure that each county has representation. Okay. No, the, the way to make it work would to have single member districts. We don't have that. Um, so this is an alternative that we're offering and, and this impacts uh, 37 as well. Well, I'll just say we single member districts doesn't really give us that opportunity either. The way that the way that we've seen it drawn. Um, but OK, let's let's move on to the next question. OK, um, next we have Johnny Mount. Uh, thanks, Chairman. Real, real, real quick, Delegate Hornberger. You know, mm -hmm. we just we've just uh, gone through the process of the census and the maps, right? Yes. So why uh, why would we change um, this now? Uh, to me, this should be done before the maps are are um, are are drawn. Um, and what is the you know this kind of follows along the lines of Senator Hershey. 
Um, you know, we've got these massive districts now, right, where we're underrepresented. Um, why would we do this after the fact? Um, no one can predict, you know, population migration. And while this was a sound idea, my argument, uh, why this was a sound idea back in the early 90s when it passed, um, we're now at a, a point where we're where we're picking winners and losers on the ballot of, of who's going to win the election and even putting um, someone, uh, you know, if we're going with the hypotheticals, you could be the highest vote getter and not get seated. So I think everybody thinks, I'm, maybe I'm speaking ahead of myself, but everybody supports a regional guarantee for representation. And, um, and, uh, um, and I just, I see this as, as what minimal protections we have for regional representation. If this were to become law, those would be undermined and there would be less protections. Even though I don't like the way the current system works, I think that this would undermine that and, and open up opportunities for, you know, multiple members from, from one county and people in different counties not getting representation. That's, I just want to share that with you and I'll turn the time over. Thanks. 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 Next up, we have uh, Delegate Grace. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And this is probably one time where uh, there's a difference of opinion and, uh, um, you know, inside of our group here. And I'm with Kevin on this one, actually. Um, the, the chances of, of and obviously I, I come from the smaller county um, out of, in District 36, and, and it's even smaller now than, than before. I think we had over 20,000 people in District and from Carolina District 36 prior to these LRAC maps. Now we're down to 13. Um, and, and if some, if we were going to have three people from either Queen Anne's, which I think has the largest population, not by much, and, and Cecil County is just behind that, in order to have three people from either one of those two counties or even two to win, they, they would have to slate up and then persuade people in the entire district to vote for those two. Um, that's the only way they can do it. Um, for me, I think it's a better chance for and more of a fair chance for anybody in the district to be on the ballot and not have the county from which they live be on the ballot. Um, and what that does is it's going to force those voters to do their research and to do their homework. Um, and we've seen, I mean, we, we, it, uh, this is, this will be my, you know, um, fifth election, two primaries, two generals. Um, and this will be the fifth one. Uh, and I've seen so many other candidates go through um, and it, you can, you, you, it's hard to tell by the, what the motivation of the voters are, um, but these are no name people and they, they end up with a lot of votes. And, it, and you wonder if they end up with a lot of votes because people just go down the ballot and they're like, OK, this is somebody who lives in my home county. So I'm going to vote for them just because they live in my home county. That's a lazy way to vote. Honestly, they should do the research um, and it's up to the candidate to get out there and introduce themselves district wide um, and and make themselves a household name or or, you know, and let the entire district know you know what they're all about. And then they're going to vote for that person rather than vote for that person just because they live in a certain county. You know, and that's just my perspective. That's all. And I, I and I but I certainly respect and I understand what everybody's saying and, and the difference of opinion on this issue. So, yeah, I, I would just add to that. If if you know, we we do have historical trends we do not have where hypotheticals played out. So historically, Caroline County, uh, for example, would never send a representative to the General Assembly just because of the way the numbers shook out since this bill has passed. And, you know, I can't go to the Board of Elections and say, hey, at the end of my name, I want super duper Republican or I'm the best or number one or some moniker attached to my name that gives me an unfair advantage. I can't do that. And uh, that's what the that's what the status quo offers. So. That's, that's why we're presenting the bill. But next question. All right, uh, Delegate Hartman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, quickly, you mentioned 37B being impacted by this. Right now, if the um, if there's a, only Adams and Ackley in the race, both from Wicomico, what, what happens under the current law? Kevin, you're muted. Yeah, so for the 37 district, um, that deals with, uh, with Talbot. Talbot has 37,000 people, whereas the others have between 15 and 20. So if, if two people ran from Talbot, the second highest vote getter would not be seated if anyone from any other county ran, even if they got five votes. Right, I understand, but right now we only have two from one county 
Um, so how would that play out under the current law? So all, all, would, all that would because the filing deadline is an overcut. So one person would have to could file from another county. If they got two votes, they would be seated and only one person from Talbot would be seated in the general. Wayne, I think to answer your question, what would happen after the filing deadline, there would be considered a vacancy on the ballot because there isn't somebody from one of the other counties. Um, and then after that filing deadline, there's that five day process. Um, the yeah, central committee would choose to seat somebody. Choose somebody to be on the ballot. Correct. But, okay. Thank you. That answers my question. Appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't see any other questions. Um, Kevin, what are you looking to accomplish with this? Are you looking for a motion? Are you looking for us to vote on this today? Or would you, I think more uh, people would really like to talk about it. Yeah, if we if we don't have a quorum, obviously we can't take a vote. But um, I, I would like, uh, you know, the, this body to evaluate the bill on its merits and uh, potentially have a vote once with quorum established. Mm. I think Otto had a question as well. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, if I may, yeah. right. you may. how does this impact District 35? Uh, the only two districts that the bill would apply to are 36 and 37. Well, uh, look, take care of your own. Thank you. All right. Um, I guess we'll just carry this over till next week. Um, at this point, uh, we're, we're running a little behind. If I could get maybe our federal delegation. Yeah, and Delegate Auto, uh, Cecil County is part of 36, so. Got it, thank you. Mr. Chairman, it's Kimberly Crowdeville from Senator Cardin's office. How are you this morning? I'll be very brief, I promise. Um, I wanted to say thank you. Delegate Jacobs covered all the issues that we're dealing with as a nation right now, and our hearts continue to go out to the folks in Ukraine. And. Uh, First, I wanted to share that the uh, $1.5 trillion funding package did pass and that we will have a joint statement uh, with Senator Van Hollen's office about the earmarks for FY22 that are coming to the Eastern Shore. So I'll get that out to you as soon as we have it. And also some of us were at celebrating Tubman Day yesterday with the Secretary of the Interior, um, Secretary Halen, uh, out at the Tubman Visitor Center yesterday. So that was a pretty cool way to spend uh, Tubman Day with her. Um, anyway, I will move along in the interest of time, sir. Okay. Nice. Good. Good morning, everyone. Melissa, Senator Van Hollen's office. Um, I won't really add anything to what Kim said. Um, I will let you know that we are meeting with Delmarva Chicken Association on Monday about the flu that has now reached into Maryland. Um, and we are also very, very, very heavily involved in getting this H2B uh, issue resolved. Um, we're working with Republican senators across the way, and hopefully we'll have something to speak on very shortly um, that is critical to our seafood industry on the shore. So thank, thank you for the time. Yeah. And uh, thank you, Chairman Ernst. Um, I won't add anything else to that other than um, I would uh, make a request, uh, if I could. Um, many of you have assisted in the past of providing local um, issues uh, information for updates. I do a periodic update to the congressman to make sure that he is aware of any local issues uh, that are happening. So um, uh, my email address is mike.arns at mail.house.gov. If I would request that if you have any local issues that you want to make sure Congressman Harris is aware of, um, please send me an email and let me uh, know about anything you want to, uh, information you want to provide. Thank you. All right. Thank you. We appreciate it. Um, we are past that bewitching hour. So I, uh, any, if there's any other questions from the body, uh, seeing none, I look for a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. aye.